Our next speaker is an academically trained futurist, a very rare role to have. His expertise is in helping leaders and their organizations like, enhance their insightful abilities into the future to, to try and sculpt it into the best version of what it can be. Please welcome John Smart. Always an honor to come to Bill, and um, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, classic. Thank you guys for coming out and putting this amazing thing together. Okay. It's help me remind me of my time. So. Okay. Yeah. So my talk today is about kind of the most interesting topic. Well. Two years ago, my talk at Bill was about the most interesting topic I've ever found, which is uh, brain preservation. So if you go to the old Bill archives, you'll discover that. And I'm, I'm a uh, co-founder of the Brain Preservation Foundation, which is trying to actually discover whether it's all of the structures that neuroscientists have implicated in learning and memory can actually be inexpensively preserved when we die. And you may have seen the small mammal prize that we gave out last month. If you're a um, if you're a mouse, you can go to the future. So, <laughs> and this year uh, we're trying to prove that that works for pigs too. So as you can imagine, it's a long road <laughs> before a bunch of neuroscientists are going to say, "Yeah, for a very small amount of money, you could just hang out and come back." But we think that it's a very interesting, reasonable thing to investigate. So that's kind of my crazy hat, and then my. Day to day had is uh, foresight, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And this is the most interesting thing I've come across in the field of foresight in my uh, 16 years in the space. And that's this idea that these agents that we're starting to use are also called virtual assistants uh, Siri, Cortana, and Google Now, and such are going to start having simple, primitive models of our values, our preferences, and even our personalities. Just like a good butler has a good internal model of who you are and you kind of anticipate your next need. And then the really interesting question becomes, when that system starts to work as a proxy for you, doing things for you, suggesting things to read, uh, people to meet, um, it's going to advise you on what to buy that best reflects your values so you can get the most social change per dollar. It's going to advise you on what to vote on, who to, what kind of initiative to actually craft, crowd, uh, vote on, and shove, shove right up into the, into the legislature from the bottom up. And you didn't have to think a lot about a lot of all of that. All the cognitive overhead for that got offloaded from you in your busy day to your, your agent, to your personal SIM. So a personal SIM is a version of a software agent that has a deep personal map of you. So those are the two terms that are kind of coming into vogue now. Intelligent agents and virtual assistants are kind of the two clunky terms that are still the dominant terms in the media. but. But we think those two terms are going to be kind of where things are going. So I have a post, uh, about seven part post coming on to Medium, which is one of these great blogging platforms. If, you, if anyone blogs, I recommend doing an excerpt of it on Medium. You're going to get five times as many people giving you comments. And the tools for posting on Medium are fantastic. And Medium is actually a very crude agent really if you think about it because you can sign up for interests on topics that you want to learn about and it's it has a very crude kind of intelligence better than any of the other tools that I've seen out there so it's not yet you know conversing with you about the kinds of things that you want to learn about but it's moving in that direction and that's the argument I'd like to make in this presentation is the more we think about our software as gaining a brain and use it in ways that maximize our values, the more we'll create the kind of world we want. So the details, like I said, 20 page post, seven parts coming out of Medium, uh, just with the same name of this. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback over there. So my passions are this little goofball, which she's seven, seven months old, so I'm gonna start with that. Um, learning a lot about the world through her. Um, 
2003, I started this nonprofit that looks at accelerating change, things that go faster every year. Uh, in June of this year, I have a 500 page book coming online. It's called The Foresight Guide. It's going to be at foresightguide.com. Yay. And uh, thanks, Alex. And in fall, we're starting this thing called Foresight University, $50 a class. In the guide, the two kind of big picture things, the 20 second things that I think are worth taking home are that there's, that there's three P's about the future you want to constantly think about. What's going to happen whether you want it to or not, what could happen, bad and good, and what you'd like, possible, probable, and preferable. And the other thing to keep in mind is when you talk about the future, everybody's looking for weebles. Does anyone remember these things? Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Yes, sir. So a weeble is a story that a bunch of cognitively diverse and smart people have tried to knock over. Well, what does it do? It just keeps getting back up. Why does it keep getting back up? Because that story about the future, the trends and the data and the evidence just seem to support it. So we don't want to just tell stories, we want to tell Weeble stories. And how do we do that? We get in places like this and we throw out these crazy ideas like this personal sim. And I see some people offended by this idea. And you should be, because there's parts of it that are offensive. When your mother dies in 2050, do you go to a tombstone to grieve or do you're going to fire up digital mom and talk to her? What do you think? <coughs> what about in 2030? She's only been running her sim for 10 years. Will she be smart enough at that point that you'll still want to talk to Digital Mom? Will you let Google make Digital Mom smarter every year by talking to all of her surviving relatives so that she's always there, able to kind of whisper in your ear when something interesting, contextually valuable happens, or not? Is that intrusive and creepy or weird, or is that potentially kind of empowering and kind of connecting you to your past? See how these things can go multiple directions, can't they? And we tell the stories now, we start thinking about them now, we start figuring out, well, we want to craft, we want to craft these things towards the preferable future that we want. So let's talk, now we move to the fast uh, stuff, okay? <laughs> we're, gonna run out of slide, we're gonna run out of time. <laughs> these are the three topics that we want to talk about. Where we are, where we may be going, and whether you want to drive there, or sit in the back and be driven by others. And I'm suggesting you guys want to be in the driver's seat for these technologies, okay? You want to be making the agents, okay? Using things like open source. Not just having big companies giving you the Comcast Xfinity agent that's going to be happy keeping you in a walled garden. No, I want my own version of the agent that is reflecting my values. So, where are we? We're here. This is from Wait But Why. I stole this. It's fantastic, right? We're in a low exponential. We think it's just going to keep going like this, but no. This is where the world's going. Okay, the agents are going to be the, one of the primary ways to understand that. Now, our universe accelerates, and the fourth side again will show you that why computers are about a million times faster at learning than you and I are. So get over it. It's just true. So that means you need to use the computers in a way that humanizes yourself. Okay? And everyone's heard of Moore's Law? But it turns out Kumi's Law is just as important, okay, as uh, Chris Watson said in his 2005 book, right? And that's every uh, 18 months, computers get uh, twice as efficient at computing. And that's why the acceleration is going to slow down. They use less and less resources. Their ecological footprint per computation just kind of disappears into inner space. That's why the thing doesn't slow down, okay? And so our frontier is really inner space, not outer space. And here's a good book on that. Physical inner space, faster, smaller, cheaper, and virtual inner, inner space, as Alex was just talking about, smarter, stabler, better. You can pre -vis things and stop problems from happening beforehand, okay? And so, remember D&D? &D? We played that in, in, call, in high school, D&D. &D. Well, densification and dematerialization are the two D&Ds you really need to think about. Everything is densifying, going into this kind of now space, and it's dematerializing, replacing physical things with information. That's chapter two of my guide, this kind of D and D world that we're going into, okay? And so there's ten areas of technology change, and the things that are accelerate, the engine of acceleration is this nanotech stuff, and then the steering is this information tech stuff. And all the other techs are being driven by those two. Those are the two special techs, okay? And so this is the J curve of wealth production to the last thousand years in Europe, and this is where the Industrial Revolution happened. So the things that cause wealth are not even human creativity so much anymore, it's technical productivity, it's the machines that we're creating, okay, and that's called TP, or technical productivity. So now we're in this world of unicorns. Unicorns, what are these? These are billion dollar companies that's, that were startups five, ten, or fifteen years ago. 
The first decacorns, $10 billion within 5, 10, or 15 years, are now on the horizon. Okay, show me. Okay, the company making the $20, $20 smartphones in the in the third world that these ki in the emerging nations, these kids are going to be wearing those while they learn some language that they're never going to use except in their little village. What are they going to learn at the same time from their agent? Everything. Yeah, everything, including the dominant the dominant languages of business, which are English and of course whatever the dominant coding languages are. These kids are going to learn. A human's going to educate them. No, this is called teacherless education. This is where the age. This is the educational power of agents. Think of the disruptions that are coming in this stuff, right? By the way, at lunch, if anyone wants to hang out at lunch, we're going to do more discussions of this stuff because we only have 15 minutes here, okay? So yeah. come and get me at lunch if you want to kind of have a lunch somewhere in here. We'll do a thing. Love those conversations. Thank you. So openness, tools, and scale are Andreessen's three words. That's the difference. The difference that makes a difference. The world's crazy open, crazy tools, crazy scale today. Okay, and you have to think about where that's going. So where, where, where may we be going? Well, turns out Moore's Law started ending in 2005. Thank goodness, because finally we can create multi-core chips. And what did that mean when we can finally create multi-core chips? It means that the world, deep learning world can happen. Okay? Because once you have multiple chips, computers can think like human brains. And that's called natural intelligence, not longer artificial intelligence. Okay. It's deep learning. And so NVIDIA's company, their first chip, their first board comes out next month. Okay? For your for your PC, that's a deep learning board. It's a brain on a on a <laughs> on a plug-in uh, board for your computer. And um, they're tackling self-driving. Remember Google? Google self-driving car? NVIDIA is trying to root Google on a self-driving car strategy. So what are they doing? They're using these these GPUs to, to train, and this is a little box that they announced and next week in, in uh, Silicon Valley at the GPU Technology Conference. They're going to be showing this off. This is a beer can or you know soda can sized box that uh, sits in your trunk. It's you know power of 150 MacBook Pros. It's not much more powerful than an existing laptop. Two orders of magnitude more. What does that thing do? That allows DriveNet, as of last year, DriveNet on image recognition for self-driving went up to went up to almost 90% over what six-month period. Freaking thing is waking up. So, so Nvidia announces, hey, we're gonna have this conference, and anybody who wants can put this computer super brain in the trunk of your car and hook it up to DriveNet and, and learn more on the cloud. And all of a sudden, Google's totally on their back foot, going, what? <laughs> And, and they're saying, you know, it's not just that. Hey, put one of these Jetson NVIDIA boards in your personal robot. We'll shrink it down, and it'll do stuff for you. And, and, and here's the Titan. That's going in, the, like I said, next month in the, in the uh, desktops, right? And, and, and we're going to create this thing called the Tesla. Who knows what that's going to do? It looks kind of big and scary, right? And so now NVIDIA is seeing their GPU platforms as kind of the bottom end of all this crazy stuff that's going to happen in the education space. And, of course, all these big players are also in their own deep learning startups, or, or adventures and startups. And so this is the conference, and remember Macworld? Anybody go to Macworld? Early Macworlds? Remember how exciting that was? Well, like, this, is the, this is the Macworld today, okay? And it starts next week, okay? And all these crazy people are going there to talk about putting brains into everything that you don't code. What do you do with these things? You train them. You train them up, okay? So the AI race is on. Deep learning started crushing conventional computer vision right around 2012, okay? And all these companies are now realize that, that, that this natural intelligence is the future. So that's the agent web, okay? The social web came, we're in it now. Remember that? And now this kind of semantic intelligent web fusion, Nova Spivak's web 3.4, 4.0, to me, that's the, that's the agent web. You're going to want to have an agent as the front end to everything that you do. Do you want that agent to be supplied by some big company? Maybe, if they're playing fair by the rules, as long as there's lots of versions of them out there. But do you want to have, like, Linux, the open source version? This is not just an app. This is an OS, like open source, but like Linux. Do I want to have, at the root level of my interaction with the world, do I want to have an agent that has private data that I know is private to me that nobody else has? 
that all my other friends are saying, yes, this code is good. This code is uh, all, with lo enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. This code is, is um, proven to be trustable by past behaviors. And um, that's really a world where you go from the knowledge graph where we are today to kind of a truthfulness, probability, and values graph where I can go and find all the other people that think like me. Right? I've gone from a smart agent to a personal sim. I'm reaching for a can of tuna, and the thing gives me the little green arrow on my AR goggles, and I move two inches because this one's no longer killing the dolphins, or the mercury levels is, is lower. And my agent sends an automatic boycott message to the big bad boys and says, you know, I'm not going to buy your crap until you do X, Y, Z, right? And did I even think about that? No, my agent did that for me. My personal sim is now a lobby sim. It's yeah. an interesting world we're in. Yeah. Thank you.